Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to episode, I think it's 88 of Left Side of the Isle. This is for December 27th to January 2nd, 2013. So we're moving on. Uh, I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson. For a eh, half hour or so, I'm going to be your ranter and raconteur, talking about things important to me I think deserve your attention. If you want to uh, respond to anything, you can contact me directly at whoviati, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. And my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be displayed a few times through the course of the show, uh, down, down here somewhere, uh, so you can uh, get the email address from there. If you email me, please include something like your cable show or left side of the aisle or some such thing so that I know it's not spam. Okay, with those now, by now, traditional introductions out of the way, we'll get right to it. First off, uh, I've been telling you over the last couple of weeks in bits and pieces about some of this grand bargain nonsense. Uh, this is the one where pundits are saying that even though Obama won re-election and the Democrats gained seats in the House and gained seats in the Senate, therefore, obviously, they're the ones that have to make concessions. Um, th you know, that would be really funny and just nothing more other than funny if it wasn't for the fact that so many dummycrats including president hopey changing himself actually seem to agree with this one example of that is that after months after months of saying to anyone within public earshot that he could not would not absolutely no way was he going to accept extension of tax cuts to people making over two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year obama's now saying yeah all right four hundred thousand and since he's already bent that far on that, at this point, there's no reason to not expect, expect him to bend even further. Uh, now, uh, by the way, uh, there are other concessions in the tax stuff he talked about. There are other concessions to the right in there, but I'm going to skip those because what I really wanted to talk about is something I'm sure you've heard about, but I want to make sure you understand it. Obama has proposed uh, a change in the way that cost of living allowances, or COLAs, are calculated for federal benefits, including Social Security. Now, the first thing to remember here is that this whole business was supposedly about the deficit. The deficit being the most important issue ever. But um, the thing is, uh, it's the most important issue ever to people inside the Beltway, to the pundits, to the well-paid lobbyists and their corporate paymasters, uh, none of who actually depend on government benefits to keep food on the table or a roof over their heads. For people out in the country, out in the real world, uh, they're a lot more concerned about the economy and jobs and things like that than they are about the deficit. But no matter, for these people, it's the deficit. And it's all about Social Security as part of that, even though the second thing to remember here is that Social Security has nothing to do with the deficit. It's got its own independent rev uh, revenue stream, the payroll tax. It does not take money from general funds. It does not add a single penny to the deficit. But still, despite that, Barack Obama has proposed cutting about $112 billion in Social Security benefits over the next 10 years. And Nancy Pelosi, the top dumb in the House, has actually actively embraced this idea. Now again, what this method is, it changes the way the cost of living allowances, or COLAs, are calculated for things like Social Security. Now, COLAs have always been calculated based on the CPI, the Consumer Price Index. That is, it's the standard measure of inflation that we use. The proposal is to change this to using what's, what's called chained CPI. Now, chained CPI is based on the idea that consumers' purchasing choices change as prices change. Uh, it assumes, in the most commonly used example, that if the price of beef goes up too much, you'll switch to a cheaper cut of meat like chicken, for example. Now, on its face, that doesn't seem like a particularly outlandish assumption, but this is the effect. Now, uh, now for the, I should tell you, for this example, it's going to be very simplified. I'm only using really two commodities, beef and chicken, as opposed to a whole market basket. And uh, the prices I'm using are they're arbitrary. They're just 
for the point, just, just for the illustration, okay? So suppose the price of ground beef, say, goes from $4 a pound to $5 a pound, and you're deciding that's getting kind of pricey for you. So you're going to switch to chicken, the price of which has gone from, say, $3 a pound to $4.50 a pound. For 50 still less than 5 so you're making the switch. All right, so here's the thing. With change CPI, it says even though the price of beef has gone up by 25%, and the price of chicken has gone up 50%, your cost has only gone from $4 a pound to $4.50 a pound, or 12.5%. Change CPI assumes that there is always a cheaper alternative. There's always a cheaper alternative, and not only that you will choose that cheaper alternative, but in fact you can choose that cheaper alternative. You will, you can, and there is one. The result is that by its very nature, chain CPI always invariably will produce a lower inflation rate than traditional CPI, again, consumer price index. So if you're calculating benefits on chain CPI, your benefits go up less. It is a cut in your future benefits. Uh, it, and, and, it's, and it's a cut. Will, that will grow year by year as each year the inflation measured one way is lower than another. The real reason the pundits and the politicals like this is because it's a hidden cut. So your benefits still go up, but they don't go up as much as they would have. So it's a hidden cut, so they're hoping you won't notice. In fact, Pelosi claimed that it's not a cut. Now, this actually strikes me as quite funny because if you have, for example, military spending, that's going to go up scores of billions of dollars over the next 10 years. But according to an agreement already made, it's going to go up less than was originally intended. That difference is being called by everybody a cut in military spending. Now, if the military budget going up less than was originally planned is a cut, why isn't the fact that your benefits are going up less than originally planned also a cut. But in fact, uh, what Pelosi did is she echoed the right-wing blather that this actually strengthens Social Security. Yeah, cutting benefits strengthens the program. By that logic, we could make the program even stronger. Uh, we don't just have reduced benefits or reduced increases. We have actual cuts. It's even stronger now. And in fact, by that logic, the strongest possible program, the one impervious to any possible economic catastrophe, is one that doesn't exist. The strongest Social Security program provides no benefits at all. That's what strong is. This is what passes for thinking among the dummycrats in Congress. And you've got to know, Social Security is not in trouble. It's not going bankrupt. It's not going belly up. It may need to be tweaked a little bit. It's been tweaked several times throughout its history. You want to fix Social Security? The best, the simplest way to absolutely protect Social Security as far out as you want, remove the ceiling on the income subject to the payroll tax. That's the simplest way to do it. All right, from there, we're going on to our uh, uh, regular weekly feature, the, uh, the Clown Award given, as always, for meritorious stupidity. There's a bill now before the House and Senate that would provide about $60 billion in aid to uh, victims of Hurricane Sandy. Uh, it would go mostly to uh, things in Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey. Uh, because the price tag for the damage that Sandy did continues to rise. Now, the bill has been criticized for several reasons, not all of them without good cause. But since a majority in Congress, including a good number of goppers, agrees that people need some kind of financial relief, these kind of conflicts are things you would expect to be ironed out in the course of debate and negotiation over the bill. However, Americans for Prosperity, a right-wing outfit chaired by David Koch, the, a multi-billionaire, doesn't see it that way. Which brings us to our clown of the week, our dishonoree, he is the state director for New Jersey of Americans for Prosperity. He's a surly fellow named Steve Lonigan. Uh, 
He's demanded the entire bill be voted down. No aid to Sandy victims. Uh, and they've even said that this is going to be a key vote on the AFP scorecard for, for Congress, which means that if you vote for this aid, that you may wind up facing a flood of uh, attack ads during your next campaign. Now, in explaining, if I can call it that, why the bill should be rejected, Lonigan said things, bad things happen every day. Uh, having your shore house flood doesn't rank. We need to suck it up and take care of ourselves. In other words, you're on your own. What's more, he said, taxpayers should not have to pay for a millionaire's vacation home. Now, for somebody who has supposedly lived in New Jersey all of his life, Lonigan knows remarkably little about the state. Places like Tom's River, Brick Highlands, Seabright, Union Beach, these are not enclaves of millionaires. These are working class and middle class communities. The shore towns have been devastated all along the shore. Families, there are families whose homes were destroyed who are still, the Federal Emergency, Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, is still spending hundreds of millions of dollars and scrambling to come up with just temporary housing for these people. As many as 25,000 households in New Jersey alone uh, have had their possessions. They've lost basically everything they needed. They still need many of them help. Businesses have been lost, lives have been upturned, and in fact, a number of lives were lost. But Steve Lonigan doesn't care. Steve Lonigan doesn't get any personal benefit from this, so he doesn't see why anybody else should. Need doesn't matter. In fact, helping victims of a, national, uh, of, of, of a natural disaster is, according to him, unfair to everyone who was not a victim. Now, Lonigan says he expects to be criticized for his views. <laughs> you got that right, fool. But what really nailed down his nomination for the award was this. Why should the bill be voted down? Because, he said, everyone is screaming about the deficit. No, Dumbo, they're not. It's, as the saying still is, it's the economy, stupid. The people, are, the people who are screaming about the debt are you and the rest of your big red-nosed cohorts at AFP, which instead of standing for Americans for Prosperity, should stand for associated fat cats and plutocrats. Steve Lonigan, you really, really are a clown. All right, one last thing before we go to break, because I wanted to get this in, because I have to tell you this. I have to take a moment to tell you that I told you so. I did. I told you. As early as November 2011, just two months after Occupy Wall Street moved into Zuccotti Park in New York and sparked the entire nationwide Occupy movement, even then, I was telling you that government officials, uh, from feds down to local cops, were coordinating and cooperating on efforts to drive out and break up those encampments. I told you that the claims the officials made the methods that were used, and the language used to justify those methods were too similar across the country for this to be a coincidence. Well, now we know for sure. Documents pried from the FBI by a Freedom of Information Act filing by a group called the Partnership for Civil Justice Fund show that the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security, the Department for the Protection of the Fatherland, we're coordinating with local police to uh, keep track of, spy on, and deal with Occupy protests. In some of those FBI files, even nonviolent protests were described as criminal activity and even domestic terrorism. In fact, the surveillance began in August 2011. That's the month before the first Occupy encampment at uh, Wall Street in New York City. And this was done even as the feds, in their own documents, acknowledged that organizers wanted nonviolent protest and did not approve of any violence that occurred during the protests. And the thing is, it wasn't even just law enforcement. Uh, the same record showed the feds coordinating with banks and other private firms about possible protest. And even the Federal Reserve in Richmond got in on the act. 
The Federal Reserve Bank in Richmond was sending information to the FBI about things it had learned about Occupy. So I'm, I told you so. When I told you there was a coordinated attempt, coordinated effort to undermine the movement, that wasn't paranoia, that was prescience. Now, footnotes of this, one news organization developed a list of seven issues that Occupy helped bring to the forefront of American political discussion. They were income inequality, the Robin Hood tax, otherwise known as the financial transaction tax, student loan debt, which is now over a trillion dollars, the Volcker, Volcker rule, which limits a bank's ability to make speculative uh, trades with its own accounts, the foreclosure crisis, the political favoring of the rich, and corporate personhood. That is what Occupy did. And we are going to take a break. And we're back, uh, which you can see. So right now, what we're going to do is move on to our other regular weekly feature, the Outrage of the Week. Last week, I spent the whole show talking about guns. Uh, at that time, I mentioned that the NRA, the, the uh, uh, National Rabbit Brains of America, had not said anything yet because the show was taped on Wednesday and they were supposed to speak on Friday. But I said I didn't expect anything different from them. And it turns out that when they finally opened their mouths, I was right. Instead of offering anything constructive or any sense of responsibility, the chief executive of the NRA, a guy named Wayne LaPierre, or as I call him, Wayne La Pipi Le Pew, uh, he blamed the Newtown massacre on anything and everything except guns. It was video games, it was movies, it was the media, it was monsters in our midst. Now, you know, this just... Let's consider the fact, for example, video games and movies. Or, you know, violent video games and violent movies are shown in nations all around the world without producing the level of bloodshed we see here. In fact, some of the most violent movies and video games are seen in Japan, which has practically no murders at all, no gun violence at all. But even so, all that was just prologue. Le Pepe Le Pew's central uh, contention was that the problem, really, is that there are not enough guns around. There are not enough people packing heat, including in schools. Uh, his answer was to have armed guards in every school in the country. Because, he said, quoting him, the only thing that stops a, good a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. All right, a quick reminder first that these mass shootings, um, the, that, uh, that these mass shootings being ended by some civilian playing Rambo and whipping out their piece, that has never happened, not once. However, there are examples of unarmed people taking down the shooter. In fact, the case of where Gabriel Giffords was shot was one of them. Now, NRA, the NRA called this a press conference, even though La Pipi Le Pew did not take any questions, but just sort of ran for the door. His statement was regarded in the media as, as anything from tone deaf to bizarre, which it certainly was. But the point is, here, it may not have been the worst. For example, the right-wing rag, the National Review, whose their in-house editorial said that, uh, in essence, that Newtown is the price we pay for the freedom of the Second Amendment. They published a piece by this twit named Charlotte Allen. It argued that the massacre of the innocents, which occurred at Newtown, happened because it was, quoting her, a feminized setting with no male teachers or other personnel around. Quoting her, think of what Sandy Hook might have been like if a couple of male teachers who had played high school football or even some of the huskier 12-year-old boys had converged on Lanza. Now, first we should point out that um, the principal of the school, her name was Dawn Huxprung, and the school psychologist named Mary Sherlock, they tried to rush Lanza and they were killed. I guess Alan thinks that all that combat training you get in high school football would have served some people better. All right, then there are those who they know the real cause, the real reason for this bloodshed. 
Uh, James Dobson, he's the founder of Focus on the Family, he said that Newtown was God's judgment for abortion and same-sex marriage. Meanwhile, Brian Fisher of the American Family Association, he claimed that God did not protect the victims because prayer had been removed from public schools 50 years before. Well, if that wasn't outrageous enough, there's a bigger outrage, which is that, you know, if we say, what can we do about this? What can we do about these mass shootings, about gun violence in general? Well, it's hard to say because... And one of the reasons, in 1996, the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, was effectively banned from doing any research on gun violence. In 2011, that ban was extended to every agency of the Department of Health and Human Services, including the National Institutes of Health. Washington and Florida have done similar things on a state level, and these bills to do the same have been proposed in seven other states. The idea is just don't tell. We don't want to know. But the biggest, the biggest outrage is the violence itself. As of Christmas Day, there had been at least, at least 190 people killed by guns in the United States since Newtown. That's an absolute minimum. It's based on news accounts. It's an absolute minimum since Newtown. What's more, there are about roughly 36,000 people killed in car crashes and car wrecks each year in the United States, uh, and about 31,000 killed by guns. So, you know, it's about, it's about 11.87 auto deaths per 100,000 people and about 10.19 per 100, uh, gun deaths per 100,000 people. So, you know, there's still more people killed by car accidents than by guns. However, Deaths by car accidents are down 31% over the last 20 years, while the number of people killed by guns continues to rise. In fact, it is now predicted that those two lines will cross each other in 2015, and there will be more people killed by guns than in car accidents. In fact, for 10 states in the United States, Alaska, Arizona, Colorado, Indiana, Michigan, Nevada, Oregon, Utah, Virginia, and Washington, in those 10 states, that is already true. In those 10 states already, more people are killed by guns than are killed in car wrecks and by cars. And quite frankly, if you can't find that to be an outrage, then... Either you're one of those monsters that Wayne La Pepe Le Pew was t telling us about, or you're Wayne La Pepe Le Pew. All right, we're going to finish up today by something. Um, going to go a little, little lighter for something. Um, just finish us up. Uh, our occasional venture to things non-political, and another thing. Uh, now, last year around this time, I gave you a, a history of the New Year as to why the New Year was on January 1st. This year I'm going to give you a very brief history of why Christmas is on December 25th. And you know, I'm going to start by saying, you know those people who talk about how, you know, Jesus, the reason for the season? He's not. He never was. He never was. See, in prehistoric times, uh, people, you know, would, would see the sun and they believed that things like the sun acted willfully, and they'd see the sun sinking lower and lower in the sky over time as winter approached, and were afraid that one of these years that sun may keep going until it disappears below the horizon, leaving them in perpetual darkness and cold. So when the sun stopped, reversed, and started to climb in the sky again, that was a cause for celebration. This is the winter solstice. Solstice comes from Latin words that basically means the sun stands still. Because sun um, comes to a stop, reverses. In the northern hemisphere, that takes place around the 21st of December. And for centuries upon centuries, all over the northern hemisphere, the winter solstice has been a time of celebration. Ancient Egypt celebrated. Ancient Greece celebrated. In fact, in the ancient, really ancient Greece, the earliest times, it actually involved a human sacrifice. But it was celebrated in Greece. Uh, the Druids celebrated Iran. It was celebrated in Iran. Uh, Native American peoples, including the Pueblo and the Hopi, they celebrated it. 
In pagan Scandinavia, it was known as the Yule, the season. Great Yule logs were burned and people would sit around drinking mead and listening to stories of great stories of legends. A boar was sacrificed to the god Odin, who donned a broad-brimmed hat and his magic blue cloak and sped around the world at night on his great white horse. Mistletoe, which was sacred, a sacred plant, it was cut and a spray given to each family to hang over their doors as a sign of good luck. You know, in fact, many of our Christmas traditions, like mistletoe, flying around the world at night, and all the rest of this, are actually come from pagan roots, including things like garlands, wreaths, and the Christmas tree. But for the date of Christmas, the most important, uh, most important thing is Rome. The solstice celebration in ancient Rome was called Saturnalia. Uh, it was a gigantic fair and a festival. It uh, began with the sacrifice of a pig. It would involve riotous merrymaking, feasting, drinking, gaming. Houses were decked with laurels and evergreens. Schools were closed. The army rested. No prisoners were executed. Friends visited one another and brought good luck gifts of like fruits and, uh, and, and dolls and candles and jewelry. Temples were decorated with, with evergreens. And there'd be processions of people through the streets with blackened faces or wearing masks, wearing fantastic hats, just dancing through the streets. Masters feasted with their slaves who could do and say what they liked, supposedly. Within Saturnalia, one particular day, December 25th, was set as the birthday of the unconquered sun. Now, before Christianity became the official religion of, of, the, of Rome in the 4th century, Christians who wanted to celebrate the birth of the man that they regarded as their savior had to hide the fact because being known as a Christian could get you killed. Well, the thing is, no one knows what time of year Jesus was born. Definitely wasn't the winter. Uh, in fact, it was most likely the spring because that was the time shepherds were most likely to be watching their flocks by night. That was to protect the newborn lambs from the wolves, and they didn't do that in the winter. So we know it wasn't born in the winter. But the point is then, since you don't know when he was born, the date that you choose to celebrate his birth, is it's symbolic, and it's kind of arbitrary. Just whatever date you choose. So if you're going to do it that way, what better time to do it than during Saturnalia when everybody else is feasting and celebrating so no one will notice you? And what better date than December 25th, already a date of feasting? Uh, by about the year 350, December 25th had been adopted in Rome as the um, day to celebrate the Christ Mass. Gradually, most of the Christian church agreed over time, and the merry side of Saturnalia was adopted to the observance of Christmas. By 1100, Christmas was the peak celebration of the year across all of Europe. That is why Christmas is on December 25th. Now, I can tell you very quickly that uh, um, Christmas got off to a rocky start in Plymouth. The people who settled here didn't like Christmas, and in fact, it wasn't until 1825 that the first mention in Plymouth's oldest paper uh, referred to Christmas. But by 1860, there were ads for Christmas gifts, and by the end of the 1800s, Christmas was the big celebration in Plymouth. So that's how we stand. Any event, that's it for me. I'm out of here. You have the best week you possibly can. You have a great New Year's and uh, we'll see you next week and hopefully with New Year's brings new hope. Bye.